Hello and welcome everyone to our October webinar on um, how to prepare legitimate R&D tax claims for your clients and HMRC. Um, delivering our session today as usual is Jen Badger and Ian Cashin, our in-house R&D tax gurus. Uh, and I am uh, Sue's commercial manager here at Whisper Claims. Um, for anyone who is already a subscriber to our community, you'll know them well, um, Jen and Ian, as they provide hands-on advice and support to our customers regarding any scheme and eligibility related queries. Um, for today, um, keeping in line with our more recent focus on practical tips and advice, um, Jen and Ian are going to cover suggested steps when preparing um, a claim, what level of knowledge you need around the scheme, um, the importance of involving your client and how vital it is to have a consistent process. Um, they will also be having a chat around the new uh, scheme legislation set to come into play in April 2023. Um, and this latter part um, of the session will be focusing on the facts as they stand right now, bearing in mind there may be some twists and turns before next year. Um, and we'll also be talking about how we'll be supporting our customers in the coming months as well. For anyone who doesn't know much about us um, or is new to our events, uh, welcome. Um, um, and here at Whisper Claims, we're passionate about empowering our community with the confidence to implement or scale their in-house R&D tax service. Um, having the right foundation in place is key and fundamental to this is a strong and reliable and consistent process. Uh, Whisper Claims has been designed by our team of experts uh, to offer you the straight out of the box so you can focus firmly on embedding yourself as your client's trusted R&D tax advisor whilst also generating a new or improved revenue stream from your existing client base. Um, as usual with these events, we are happy to um, have questions come through at any point, um, but during the session, if I can ask you to please use the Q&A box for questions you'd like us to um, take on um, in the Q&A bit at the end, and just use the chat box if you want to chat to myself um, or the panel or everybody if you've got some uh, other comments that you'd like to make too. Um, without further ado, um, over to you, Jen and Ian. Cool. Thanks, Suze. Um, so as Sue says, what we'll be covering today is... I'll talk, use my, my usual high horse about HMRC and what acceptance of claims means. We'll then talk about very briefly the kind of process what you need to think about to prepare a legitimate claim. And then we'll talk through the major April 2023 updates as they currently stand. And then we'll have a bit of a QA. and a So as I say, my usual high horse that just cuts out the people saying, yeah, but uh, at the end of this. Um, what you see a lot with um, people that work in R&D tax relief is they'll say they've got 100% acceptance of claims. So the word acceptance in that context is pretty much meaningless. Um, evidence suggests that HMRC are really unlikely to read or check every claim in any detail. Um, obviously, over the summer, they checked a lot more, but they're going back to their usual level now. So what they seem to do is they get the tax returns, those are checked, credits paid out, and then they'll do further checking for some claims. So in terms of acceptance of claims, all you can ever say is that HMRC hasn't asked questions yet. Unless you've been through a full inquiry process, HMRC has looked at it in absolute detail, you've answered all the questions, and then they've said, we accept this claim. All you can ever know is that they haven't questioned it yet. So this is just to kind of set the tone for things like, you know, it'd be, oh, I know someone that got a claim through put through for a care home and HMRC accepted it. What that might mean is HMRC didn't look at it in any detail um, and they might have inquired into it, thrown it out, had they actually looked at it. So just to say that acceptance, fairly meaningless, and it's a lot to do with the way that HMRC um, police the, the scheme. Um, okay, over to you, Ian. Thanks, Jen. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll talk about um, preparing legitimate claims. So, so if you're going to be advising your clients um, on the search and development tax relief, obviously it's pretty important that you know um, the eligibility criteria yourself. Um, this uh, eligibility criteria comes from the BEIS guidelines, which are set out in the CURD. So you you often hear us talking about the CURDs, various different chapters, par paragraphs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's the Corporate Intangibles Manual. <clears throat> and basically, it's it's the BEIS Bible um, for R and D tax relief. Um, Probably the most important parts to understand um, would be um, 81900 and 81300. And they're basically the fundamentals of what R&D is. It's, it sets out um, what uh, is, is classed as, as R&D as, as far as HMRC are concerned. Um, they're the most important parts, but um, it's, it's also good to know, you know, 
what an SME definition is, and that's covered in 91,000. Um, basically, it, it covers off things like um, the the headcounts, um, turnover of a company threshold, uh, sorry, the turnover threshold for a company, whether they're part of a group, um, who owns the company, shareholders, et cetera, et cetera. That's all covered in, the, in, in that category, in, in that um in that section there. Um, then the next thing you'll want to know is what qualifies as um, eligible expenditure. And that's covered in 82000. Um, eligible categories are mainly your staffing costs, but you'll also have costs for materials consumed during the process or destroyed during a process, um, and also any materials used in, in prototyping, etc. And that just explains what you can actually claim for in that sense. Um, and then something we've come across more and more importantly um, in the last couple of years is the treatment of grants. And that's covered off in 81650. Um, it basically covers off all types of subsidized expenditure. Um, since coronavirus, um, the utilization of grants has massively gone up. So if you're advising your client, you'll probably have seen in the last couple of years, they're now looking for more grants, they're utilizing grants. Um, things like um, bounce back loans, they all follow fall into those uh, that type of category. So it's worth brushing up on um, 81650 as well. Um, if you use our app, you will see at every section, there is a link to the the relevant section within the curd as well. So if you're one of our users, you will all you you'll you'll know about this, and there will be links to it at, at every point as well. Um, obviously, the curd is a huge manual. It's only really um, sad people like me and Jen who who <laughs> regularly read up on this. But um, there are more bits to be to be kind of get in depth with. But those sections there are probably the most important that you should read up on. Um, so why would you want to, to know all this? Well, at the end of the day, if you're advising your clients, you need to educate your clients on what qualifies and what we can look at, what, what type of expenditure they're going to, they're going to be able to claim for. Um, as I said, you don't need to know, um, it in depth and your, and your, your client doesn't need to know it all in depth, but you need to at least explain to them what parts are relevant to their claims or what constitutes R and D, um, you know, it must be a, an advancement in the field of science and technology. They must be using competent professionals within it. Uh, and it can't be a simple solution uh, to a problem they have. Um, the important thing about that is it's not your claim. Um, it's the company's claim. Um, so they will know what is an advancement in the field of science and technology more than you do. Um, it's your client who is at the, the, the coal face of, of advancement. It's their business. They know what's difficult. They know what's, what's um, hard to overcome. So whilst you can advise them, you can't tell them that it was definitely different or definitely difficult. And it, it's up to them to, to establish that themselves. I'll spark off, Jen. Thanks. So once you've got that kind of education that you were talking about there, the next key thing you need to be able to prepare robust solid claims is a consistent process so you need to be asking the right questions every time to every client um you need to make sure you're not missing anything you need to be checking even with clients you've worked with in the past it's things like make sure that the company structure hasn't changed they haven't suddenly flipped over so they'd have to claim as a large company rather than sme all these things every time you need to be checking you need to be asking about grants every time you need to be checking what they actually did and obviously as sue's mentioned Whisper claims can give you that consistent process. Um, the key thing here is there's no real right or wrong. There's definitely very, very wrong ways of doing it. We've seen some of that. Um, you need to speak to your client for a start. We have seen some people say that they've seen claims go through without the client actually being spoken to. That is definitely wrong. But the main thing you need to do is find something that works for you and the way that you work. You need to be questioning your client in a structured fashion. So as I say, you need to go through all the questions with every client every time and make sure you're covering everything off. Now, you need to produce a technical narrative. We'll talk a bit more about technical technical narratives a little bit later, um, purely because that's not actually something you've had to give HMRC up till now, but it's very much considered best practice. And for Info 2023, you're not going to have a choice about that. So you need to produce a technical narrative describing 
the advances, um, what the baseline was at the beginning and kind of what they did to try and resolve it, why it was difficult, what the uncertainties were. And you'll need a cost breakdown showing the different categories of cost and how much of that was spent on R&D. Um, again, these are kind of things that if HMRC look into a claim, the first things they ask, they will ask about is, you know, what were the costs and what were the advances and that kind of thing. So if you're providing that up front, you're at least getting ahead of those questions. And the key thing at the end of the process is that your client actually reviews and signs off on the claim. <clears throat> it is, as Ian said, their claim. It's really important that they have ownership of it. Um, if HMRC do ask questions, um, having gone through a consistent process helps you defend it. But having an engaged client who can work with you um, to answer HMRC's questions is um, absolutely key. You can't defend a claim without the client there. And if they haven't reviewed and signed off on the claim, you're already on the back foot if HMRC do come back with any questions. Um, I'll pass back to Ian. Thanks, Jen. Um, so we all know that um, R&D tax relief can be quite lucrative. Um, so that's probably the main advantage to it. it. You know, it's an easy way, not an easy way, but it's it's a, a, an efficient way of claiming back a third of your expenditure um, on a project. Um, so it is very advantageous in that sense, but there are risks to that as well. Um, it's worth setting that out with your client when you speak to them for the first time that yes, it's lucrative, but there are risks to it. Um, nobody wants to be sat, sat down with uh, HMRC for any longer than they need to. And um, I've heard anecdotal uh, um, conversations of claims that can, or inquiries that can go on for two years. Um, it's not unusual if they're not satisfied with something, um, but it is just worth explaining that to your client as well, that it's not, you know, a sure thing. Um, there are risks involved with it as well. Um, your client, no doubt, will at some point have been told that they're eligible to claim R&D. A lot of the time, it's they've, the person on the other end of the phone has not even assessed them in any way. They've just seen that they're in an industry and they're making cold calls to try and entice people to make a claim. Um, if you're their trusted advisor, sometimes it is up to you to tell them they're not eligible. Um, they've come to you for advice, they trust you, um, and therefore sometimes a claim is not an eligible claim. Um, and this is um, relevant for a couple of reasons. One, they just don't qualify. But second of all, um, what would have been eligible last year may not be eligible this year um, for a number of reasons that R&D is constantly evolving. So what was an advancement last year should have actually either finished or it's at a next stage of advancement. So it's not always the case that if your client was doing something last year that they will be doing uh, R&D again this year. Um, and also things that you know you used to be able to claim for years ago are not eligible now. I remember a time when we were able to claim for building a website. Um, you know, a 15 year old kid can build a website in his, in his bedroom now in, in the matter of a couple of hours. So things that used to be eligible are not eligible. Um, and again, in case we haven't um, hit on this enough already, the claim belongs to your client. It is your client who's going to be sat in front of HMRC if it goes to inquiry. They need to understand that what they're claiming for is eligible um, and that it needs to stand up to, to HMRC. Um, scrutiny in that sense. Cool. So having done a very whistle stop, this is how to prepare a legitimate claim. Obviously, some aspects of claiming are going to change in April 2023, as we understand at the moment. Um, the legislation is still in draft form. We've had some changes of leadership recently in this country. So we're not, these things might change. So all we can do is tell you about the things that are currently in the draft legislation and the way that they are presented in the draft legislation. So the legislation itself might change um, or these things might be thrown out completely, but we have to assume these were announced uh, this time last year. The draft legislation came out in the summer. So as far as we're aware, these are still coming in, these changes are coming in and we'll have to work with them as they come through. So the major things that are changing, there's some new categories of eligible costs. There's some changes to subcontractor and EPW rules. And there's quite a few changes to submission requirements around digital submission, additional information and pre-notification. Um, most of this is sort of two focuses from the government in this. One is around focusing the R&D back on the UK and making sure that the UK as a whole 
benefits from the scheme and around uh, increasing compliance and reducing fraud. Um, we know over the summer, of the HMRC now call it a, um, a case of criminal conduct within the R&D scheme. So they are very, very keen to kind of clamp down a wee bit and keep everyone compliant. So we're just going to go through each of those in turn. Um, and as I say, the information we have is the information we have right now. If things change, we'll do this webinar again and tell you about those changes. Okay, I think Ian's up first. Yeah, we won't do any U-turns though. It'll be just new information. <laughs> That's my political rant hour. <laughs> um, so in terms of what's now going to be eligible going forward. Um, these changes are only taking effect from the 1st of April, 2023. You can't apportion the cost based on the year that the claim period must start after the 1st of April, 2023. So if you have a client that is starting their financial year in January, it'll have to be the following year when they can start claiming these costs. Um, the big ones that they've added in are um, pure mathematics. So it used to be just applied mathematics um, that was eligible, but now they're including pure maths. Um, and a big cost um, to a lot of companies nowadays is cloud computing and data licenses. Um, they never used to be um, allowable as a cost, and now they're including them in. So uh, cloud computing services include the provision of access and the provision of access to and maintenance of remote data storage operating systems, software platforms, and hardware facilities. So basically, the type of thing that is hosted by AWS. Um, I remember about five years ago, having an argument with HMRC over the eligibility of um, AWS on the claim. The first time I'd ever come across it, uh, one of my clients was a, um, a reasonably sized uh, AI company, and, and most of their... Um, Everything, everything was hosted by AWS and, and the costs were phenomenal. Um, and HMRC just said it wasn't an allowable cost. And so it's good now to see if they're bringing it back in. Um, and a data license is a license and to, to access and use a collection of digital data. So again, that's, again, things that are hosted by AWS um, are now, not just AWS, but all of those uh, cloud hosts, um, they will all be um, eligible spend going forward. So the next big change, and I think probably the most controversial, um, and potentially the most likely to be thrown out, but who knows. So again, these would be for claim periods starting after the 1st of April 2023. So there will be an overlap time when you'll have some claims where you can include these costs and some where you can't. But for claims starting after 1st April 2023, payments made to overseas subcontractors and overseas externally provided workers, so agency workers, anyone employed through a third party, will no longer be allowable costs. So if your client has hired a load of Ukrainian software developers to develop software for them, those are not, and they're not taxed through UK PYE, they will not be able to include those costs. If you've they've hired someone in the States to do some work for them, again, that's not an allowable cost now or won't be an allowable cost anymore. The only exemption to this is if subcontracted work has to be overtaken on undertaken overseas because the required geographical, environmental, or social conditions are not present or replicable in the UK. So they're really tight on that. They have basically said anything to do with economical issues, sort of cost constraints, anything around that, anything to do with, you know, you can't, and we know we're a software company, it's really hard to recruit software developers in the UK at the moment. They don't care. That is not a reason for that would allow you to say that that cost of being exempt. So it's only if for example, they're, search, they're researching undersea vents and there aren't any of the right type around the UK and they have to go to, I don't know, Hawaii um, to study that, then potentially those costs would be allowable, but otherwise you can't do it. So this, as I say, is, is a wee bit controversial. Um, a lot of people have argued that it's quite restrictive, but this is the way it is. And at the moment, it's gone through all these rounds of consultation and everything, and it's still sitting in the in the draft legislation. Um, and again, the complication will come when we've got, you're doing a claim for one client that ends in, say, December 23, and they can still claim for the overseas subcontractors, but you've got another claim where they started after the 1st of April and they can't. So you've just got to be really careful about which ones you're including at any given time. Okay. Um, so from the 1st of April 2023, um, HMRC will no longer accept um, claims filed by post. Um, they need to be um, all submitted as, as uh, with um, tax filing software. Um, 
at a recent meeting, um, probably 18 months ago now, I think, they announced that they would be building a, um, a portal um, to deal with this. But um, the portal is still in the build phase, apparently. They've not completed it. Um, but that will take into things like um, being able to sign for it digitally, um, submit it digitally. But for the time being, they won't accept, uh, after April 2023, they will not accept um, claims um, submitted by post, they must be submitted with tax filing software. And we again, this is one where the wording of the legislation might get changed because yeah, it says the way HMRC are putting this in their like summary of the of the changes, it would be for claims starting after first April. But clearly, I think from first April that it's going to be all claims. They're not going to care on the, about the claim period. But yeah. we'll, we'll see when it all gets tied up. Um. So as I mentioned briefly earlier, one of the biggest changes and actually I think really welcomed by most people in this sector is from the 1st of April 2023. And again, it's hard to know whether this will be only for claims starting after 1st April or just from that date. Um, it, the legislation is a wee bit unclear at the moment. Um, HMRC are going to be given the power to require additional information about R&D claims. So up till this point, there's not been any mandate, mandated available um, information that you have to provide uh, to support your claim. So that has allowed people to purely put a number for R&D and the CT600 submit that. And technically, HMRC can't do anything about that. Your farmer will like to ask questions if you do that, but that's a different thing. Um, so what the legislation actually says is the commissioners for revenue and customs may, may by regulations specify in relation to a claim, which is this part of the schedule applies, information provided by the claimant company and the form and manner in which this information is to be provided. So they're being given that power. What we don't have any information about yet is what that actually means. So what HMRC are going to want, how they're going to want it provided. As Ian says, there's been rumblings about them potentially building their own portal for doing this. There's nothing on HMRC haven't revealed anything about that yet. Our assumption is, at least at first, it's probably going to be that you've got to provide a technical narrative and a cost breakdown as a minimum. And they're probably not going to mandate the layout or anything yet until they've got their portal or whatever it is they decide to do um, in, in terms of gathering that information. As soon Again, as soon as HMRC say what they're going to be doing, we'll um, keep everyone informed. But for now... All we can say is that they're going to be allowed to require more information and it's probably going to be around the usual things they ask for. So the technical advances, technical uncertainties um, and the costs. But as I say, we'll let you know as and when we know more. So <clears throat> one of the other controversial um, things that they've announced uh, at the start from period starting off the 1st of April next year is that um, any claims um, that you're intending to make must be notified to HMRC within six months of the end of that accounting period. Um, so currently the way it stands is any, um, any claims that you wish to make for two prior accounting periods must be done before the end of the current financial year. And that's changing to within six months, uh, unless they have already made a claim within the last three years. Um, any company that's made a claim in the last three years is exempt from that requirement. But the controversial part of this is the fact that often a company doesn't know that they're actually doing R&D until they're actually in the middle of doing the R&D. And that can continue on past the financial period. And you know they, they might miss a deadline of notifying HMRC um, of that. So it, it's quite controversial. That It's almost shutting off a door for work that they did two years ago um, because they didn't realise at the time it was eligible. But maybe their accountant has kind of highlighted them that actually the work you did in, in 2021 um should actually be 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 eligible for R&D but now you won't be able to to um to claim that unless you've notified HMRC within 6 months again they've not actually um told us how this notification uh, or pre-notification is to take place we again assume it's going to be in this portal that they're building um but um it, the fact is from from April twenty from for periods starting after April first, twenty twenty three, you must notify HMRC within six months. Um, so the company is not entitled to an R and D 
credit under Section 1054 in relation to the claim period unless it has made a claim notification within the period six months beginning with the last day of the claim period. That's pretty much what I just said. Should have read that at the start. Sorry. Over to you, Jen. Cool. So the other thing, obviously, that's coming in in first April is not directly related to R and D tax relief, but it does affect it, and that's the current. And obviously, this has gone back and forward a few times recently. Currently, corporation tax is due to increase twenty five percent from the first of April for companies with over two hundred fifty thousand pounds of profits. Um. For companies with less than £50,000 profits, the rate remains 19%, and then there'll be a marginal rate for companies in that middle bit. So obviously, the tax rate doesn't directly affect how a company makes a claim, what it claims for, any sort of part of the claim. But what it does is, obviously, because it's a tax relief, um, the tax benefit increases for making a claim. So if a company is going to be paying 25%, uh, reducing its profits per tax will reduce the amount of tax it has to pay. So the tax benefit increases. Um, but it, the main thing it may affect is that discussion you have with your client about how to utilize, especially losses created through um, claiming R&D tax relief. Um, the example we've got here, obviously, is right now, if a claiming company decides to surrender £100,000 of losses to get a cash credit, um, they would currently get £14,500. Um, if they get the cash credit or if they carry it forward, they'd get a reduction in tax of £19,000, assuming you know they make profits in preceding years, all that kind of thing. So we tend to see most companies will choose to get the cash credit and have the money now rather than wait till they're profitable enough to use those carried forward losses. However, obviously, if a company knows that they're going to tip into the 25% tax rate in the next year or two, it might actually become more beneficial to carry those losses forward um, than uh, surrender them for a cash credit. So it's just something to bear in mind when you're talking to your client around tax benefits and using the claim and all that kind of thing. So when you're calculating tax benefit anywhere you use 19%, you're going to want to use 25% if they've got large profits and you're going to want to really think about um, the, the sort of cost benefit analysis of getting cash credit versus carrying the losses forward. Um, so Having said all of that, and obviously we have actually got quite a lot of questions already through, which is good. Um, what we always like to say at the end of these things is regardless of how you feel about a claim, there's, don't ever claim if the work doesn't fit HMRC's criteria. Whether you think it's super safe, they'll never look at it, it's a tiny claim, don't claim if it doesn't fit HMRC's criteria. All it's going to do is harm your reputation with HMRC and the client. Um, don't claim if the company can't produce a competent professional in a relevant area of science and technology. So if you need to prepare all claims as if HMRC are going to ask lots and lots of questions about it. And if they can't produce someone that can answer technical questions, it's not worth the risk. Um, don't claim if the company hasn't been advised by a competent professional that R&D is necessary. So this is where maybe they're using a subcontractor to do the R&D. And actually, nobody at the subcontracting company thinks this is difficult. It's just new to the, the claimant company. Potentially, there's actually no R&D there. So you need somebody competent in your science and technology saying that the R&D is needed. And fundamentally, and as we've been hammering home, it's your client's claim. So if you aren't comfortable or your client isn't comfortable making the claim, regardless of whether they could get £100,000 back and it would be life-changing for everyone involved, if, no, if people aren't comfortable, don't do it. Because if HMRC come asking questions, you've got to then defend something that you weren't happy about in the first place. Um, and it's definitely not worth that risk. Um, I'm going to hand over to Suze for a few announcements and then we'll be back to do the Q&A section. Thanks, Jen. Um, as usual, just a couple of um, reminders for me. So um, we run a monthly training course. So if there is anybody um, in the event today who is interested in learning a bit more about the fundamentals of the R&D tax scheme, um, um, I'll have um, some links posted up in the chat box in just a moment um, for everyone to um, be able to have a look at and browse through um, the dates. Um, it's there for anybody who has got a base level of knowledge and just wants to be equipped with even more knowledge. Um, it's there for noobs. It's, it's a really, really easy to digest course run by Jen in here as well so it'll be them who'll be um, taking you through uh, the process. Um, we also have a YouTube channel, our YouTube channel has been live for um, a good long while now and um, it's a really great place, a good resource for you to go and watch back um, events like today if you maybe didn't manage to catch up on everything or you want to um, get some training or CPD hours in, um, please feel free to um, click on the link again that I'll post in just a moment in the chat box um, to have a look at and review. 
just a reminder that anything that's specifically eligibility related is only available um, if you're a subscriber to watch back. Our events are uh, generally speaking open to the public um, to watch uh, and be part of on the day, uh, but watching back uh, the eligibility webinars are only for subscribers. Um, one other thing or two other things actually um, is that if anybody uh, on the session today is interested in seeing a demo of our Whisper Claims um, app, please feel free to get in touch too. Uh, my contact details will be available in just a moment. And one final thing, um, this is a, a big plea uh, coming from um, uh, the team, specifically our marketing team, uh, we need you. <laughs> uh, we are always striving to make sure that Whisper Claims is um, as good as it can be and um, is, is making sure that um, all of the needs of our customers are being met. And um, so we're currently working in partnership with Human Thing um, to help us gain some insights into opinions, motivations, uh, any barriers around the R&D tax scheme and the use of tech in preparing claims. Um, if there is anybody um, today who's interested in taking part in, in the research, your time will be rewarded. Um, um, and we are mentioning it here today specifically because we'd love to speak to anybody who doesn't currently use Whisper Claims. Um, all the details are going to be sent out to the audience um, via email after the event today. So um, take a bit of time to have a little think, uh, but do get in touch if it's something that you may find interesting to take part in. We'd love to have you. Uh, okay, that's it from me, Jen. Um, shall, we, um, shall we go to questions? Yep, let's do it. Uh, I'll take the first sure. one. Um, okay, so Martin. Hi, Martin. Thanks for your question. Um, is the music industry covered uh, by the R&D tax scheme? With the R&D tax scheme. <laughs> Love you yeah. making that face. Pot I mean, potentially, yes. Um, it, it I, I guess, it would depend on what aspect of the music industry. Um, the, the, there's, there's no, there's no limitation to what industries actually will qualify for R&D. Um, it just they just need to demonstrate that they have advanced the field of science and technology. So I'm assuming if it's in the recorded music uh, and, and the recording of music, you know, things like, you know, um, making a sound more crisp or, you know, increasing the sound quality and stuff like that, you know, th there, there's got to be some form of technology used in that. So I would assume yes, from that perspective. But like I say, there's no industry that can't qualify. It just needs to demonstrate they're doing something that's scientifically challenging. Anything you want to add to that, Jen? No, that's exactly what I would have said. <laughs> Fair enough. Or I've just given Jen a little task because I've, I've, <laughs> my permissions have gone a bit haywire today and I can <laughs> Jen's just doing that for everyone just now, the links I was just talking about a moment ago. Um, okay, uh, next question from Darren. Thank you, Darren. Um, regarding uh, post 1st of April 23 changes, if you have an overseas connected company that undertakes the R&D work and pays its employees, would these be eligible? No. Sorry, I've lost all my screens. Sorry. Um... <laughs> no. Is the answer no okay. yeah essentially um unless those employees are paid through uk pye you're not going to be able to claim for them that's the it seems to be the rule at the moment it doesn't actually directly deal with connected companies very well um but yeah if they're not paid through pye that's it okay thanks guys um, next question from Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Um, if a company needs to use a machine system that does not exist in the UK, can they claim the cost to test abroad? The company needs to demonstrate its new material can operate on all types of industry process, collect that data and decide further iterations required. I would think that falls under the geographical limitations. Um, so I would, I, if, if, if it doesn't physically exist here and they need to go and, and, and do it abroad, then I would imagine that would probably qualify. Yeah, the other thing is, it depends what you might claim the cost. So obviously, if you're sending it to someone and they're testing it on your behalf as a subcontractor, then yeah, you'd need to make sure it fitted the exemptions, which it feels like it does. If you're talking to people going abroad to test it on a machine, then that's a different type of cost anyway that would still be allowable. Um, things like your staff time, if you're sending your own staff abroad to do something, then that time would still be, you know, they're still being paid through UK PAYE, P -A -Y -E, so you're absolutely fine. Thank you. Uh, next question. Is there an ebook or printable version of the CURD available to your knowledge? Well, we don't want to print things. That would take up, <laughs> you'd, you'd kill about 15 trees if you were <laughs> trying to like, print out the whole CURD. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can, you can, you can, um, it's the gov.uk website 
what was that HMOC and just search CURD, CIRD, and it'll be in there. But don't print it off. It'll take ages for starters and it'll be about this big. Trust yeah. me, I, ha I have one. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah, essentially the website's laid out like an ebook anyway. I don't see, I've never seen anyone other than Ian with a printout <laughs> at all. I'm old, I'm just old. But there isn't, a, I don't think there's a downloadable thing, is there, Ian, anything like that? I've never seen. I don't believe no. there is. Yeah. Um, there, there used to be, because obviously that's, mm. that was a thing back then, but yeah, I think it's all just online now. Mm -hmm. Thanks, guys. Uh, next one, uh, we're recording to present to attendees. Yes, Anthony, uh, we will be sending out um, an email with um, the recording. It will either be today or might be tomorrow, um, depending on um, how quickly we can get it organised. So yes, is the answer um, to that one. Uh, next question from Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Um, some claims companies do not give a copy of the claim to the client to protect their IP. How is this even possible as a client is responsible for the claim? Yeah, that's Jen bad and I are both practice. gone. <laughs> that we're both cringing here. Yeah, that would not be considered good practice, um, in our opinion. Obviously, as we've said, clients should take ownership of the claim, and they they very very definitely should see a copy of whatever is being sent to HMRC on their behalf. You wouldn't ever fill out a tax return for your client, send it off without their say so. So you shouldn't be doing R and D claims without their absolute knowledge and. Um, permission almost to do that so yeah, yeah it's it's possible because that's how people work but it's not it's, it's probably not ethical in many yeah. ways I, I think this is part i think this has been kind of doing the rounds for a while now not not too long because i think i only heard about it in the last kind of two years myself but i think that's part of the reason why going forward claims need to be signed off by a um, an official from the company because I think claims were going in to HMRC not having ever been seen by the company themselves um, and obviously that kind of throws out questions as to eligibility when they come back through an inquiry phase so having to be signed off by an officer of the company is one of the measures I think they've brought in to combat this but I, I certainly don't agree with people saying you can't see the report because it's my IP I don't agree with that at all. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question. Um, are we to expect marginal relief for corporation tax in April 2023? So this is one of those things where I very quickly looked at the corporation tax changes ah. yesterday. Um, at the moment, I think yes. I'm not an expert in corporation tax, to be honest, only where it intersects with uh, R&D tax relief if, uh, to be completely honest. So um, as far as I know, but as I say, obviously that particular change has gone back and forward recently. So I can't say for sure. Um, but according to what I read yesterday on the government website, yes, it seems to be there's going to be some kind of marginal relief, something to do with that, but I don't know exactly. Thanks, Jen. Um, and I think this one's from Martin. Sorry, I hope I got this right. You, you were asking about the music um, question earlier on. So I'm just saying that, yes, it's a database to track royalties for clients. Um, uh, again, Martin, so long as I, I, a database wouldn't, to me, um, scream an advancement in science and technology. So without knowing what that database does, and how it tracks the royalties, then it's really difficult to say. Um, I, I don't know, have you asked a question about this before, but I, I recognize that database of tracking royalties in the music industry. Um, it, 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 to reiterate, it needs, whatever that database does, it needs to demonstrate to HMRC that there wasn't a readily available solution there and that they had to overcome technical uncertainties building it and the technical certainties weren't readily solvable by, comp by competent professionals. If they can satisfy that, then that would absolutely qualify for R&D. Super, thanks guys. Uh, next one, um, are there any consequences for not making an R&D claim after a notification has been made under the new pre-notification of claims rules? Otherwise, all clients could make a notification to give them time to review whether or not there is R&D activity or qualifying costs. That's it. Yeah, at the moment, and again, this is where, because the secondary legislation hasn't been published, 
to me, that makes logical sense as you would just do a blanket notification for all your clients to make sure they don't miss out. I don't know whether they'll put something in to prevent that happening. It would seem unfair to penalise people if they, you know, put in a notification for six months and then realise that whatever they were doing wasn't eligible. Um, they might be doing R&D batch or the way they structured it means they can't make the claim. So, yeah, at the moment, there's nothing saying that if you made a notification and didn't claim, there'd be consequences. So I'm not recommending that you do that, but it is a potentially a way around it at the moment. Um, but it really depend on what... Basically, I think it depend on how onerous the notification process is and, as you say, whether there's any comeback on it. But, yeah, at the moment, nope, there's nothing happening. So feel free. Thanks. Uh, okay, a uh, question from Rachel uh, regarding the overseas subcontractors, please. Can I just double check that if subcontractors reside overseas, though are taxed through UK PRYE, would they be eligible costs? So I think this question is maybe conflating two separate things. So if you've got EPWs, as I say, externally provided workers, which could be, as I say, subcontract. Um, you know, Ukrainian software developers that you're paying an agency and the software developers work for you. If they were taxed through PAYE, but they live abroad, that would be fine. Um, the subcontractors, it seems to be more of a location thing. So it would be, probably be to do with whether they would be subject to UK taxes at all. Um, it's difficult in the case of an individual. If that individual is living abroad, but choosing to pay a UK tax, possibly. The legislation doesn't go into much detail about it. It seems to focus mostly on location. I think the assumption is if you're using subcontractors, their companies, and they need to be in the UK to be subject to UK corporation tax, and that's the way they want it to flow. And this is something that might get clarified as the legislation gets firmed up. But I think that's right. Does that, does that work? That, is that within your understanding of it, Ian? Yeah, that's pretty much my interpretation of it as well, without them actually clarifying it yet, mm -hmm. which no doubt they will do by then. Um, yeah. My interpretation is exactly as you just said. Yeah. EPW, separate subcontractors, location. Yeah. Okay. Um, Maria has asked, do you know how you have to notify HMRC that you intend to claim in the future? Not yet. Not yet. Right. No. Okay. Sorry, Maria. We will let you know as soon as we. Short and sweet for that one. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, question, Tessin. I will. I'll try and fly through these because I'm very aware of everyone's time. But if you're happy to stay, we'll, we'll try and make sure that we can cover all of them off. Um, do we need to provide HMRC with evidence of creating IP when it comes to the recent cap of R and D tax credits? If so, what evidence can we provide if the IP is in the process of creation, i.e., there is no patent or trademark, etc.? So this is something I haven't actually really been cool. asked. It's a good question. Um, yeah. So this is obviously referring to the cap on R&D tax credits being paid out uh, for small companies to do with, the, you know, it's capped for, in terms of the POA and NICs paid by the company, unless they're creating IP. I don't know what evidence HMRC would look for, and I'm not sure it's particularly well described. It seems to be just if you're creating PA, so. It might be something I have to get back to you on, actually, because mm, I, I genuinely don't know. I hadn't even thought about it, to be perfectly honest. Mm. I, I thought IP was quite a straightforward definition, but actually, yeah, how do you define what you're actually creating, particularly if there isn't any? Now that we're saying this, I do think I dug into the legislation of this ages ago, and there is a very strict definition of what they mean by IP. I can't there is, what but it is. There is, so. but it again, with that in mind, it's it's how would you actually demonstrate mm -hmm. that what they're doing is actually creating that yeah yeah we'll have to we'll definitely get back to you on that one yeah cool thanks Tessie. or we may come back with it we don't know answer it as well <laughs> <laughs> uh next one oh, what if you have a disability that requires printing a physical copy of the code is it worth getting in touch with hmrc i, I would imagine yes formats or anything that you want to try yeah. and get, it's probably the best thing to to contact yeah directly yeah okay thanks guys um maria again hi maria uh, how long do hmrc have to inquire into a claim so this is one of those it depends um it's the same as any other tax arrangement so sort of simple things i think it's a few years if they suspect something's going on then they've got up to 20 years so if they suspect serious fraud they've got up to 20 years to open it up so you can't ever assume that HMRC won't ask questions. Obviously, if you're doing everything above board and everything is legitimate and robust, they're not going to open a claim for 20 years ago. But 
they have those powers to open things up for a very, very long time if they suspect something seriously wrong has been done. Okay, great. Um, and uh, another one um, from Martin. Um, hi, Ian. If you set the company contact as a collaborator with your excellent software, thank you, Martin, um, that should cover authorization. But I think, Martin, are you referring to authorization that the client is happy and signed off on the claim? If so, that's a, a no, isn't it? it uh, yeah, there will be there will be some form of it. Again, but just inviting to collaborate, you know, HMOC are already making the assumption that your client is collaborating with you on it because you're obviously extracting that information from them because you're not the competent professional in their company. Um, so by just inviting them to collaborate on our, uh, on the Whisper Claims platform um, is not going to pass that scrutiny with HMRC, they will want to see some kind of digital signature to the actual submission itself, um, be that in like a DocuSign type of thing or whatever way it works. We're not sure yet, though. Yeah. So just to jump in on that one, because I realized that we were going to talk about the changes we're going to make. To exactly. Yeah. <laughs> just and to me as I said we that. got distracted. <laughs> um, so what we're looking at doing, Martin, is setting up so you will be able to this is something I have to speak to the tech guys about it's a bit complicated, but we will at least be giving you kind of space within the report to get a signature from your client so you could put it into your own signature software. Ideally, what we're hoping to build is an ability for within the app to sort of click a button to say send out for signature and you'd be able to get it signed off that way. Um, just to cover this off because we don't have any current questions and I realize I completely forgot to say it during the thing. But obviously, all of these changes we talked about, we will be making changes to the Waste for Claims app to allow for that. So a lot of them, obviously, things like um, the OC subcontractors, the EPW stuff, it's more changes to the advice we give you. The questions will remain the same, but we'll make sure that you know, like, for example, in this um, subcontractor thing, we'll make sure there's a tick box so you're reminded that all the, all the subcontractors have to be either UK subcontractors or exempt from those rules. Um, we'll be putting in a check to make sure that... HMRC being given the required notification if that's needed, um, just because we don't want anyone preparing a claim, paying for it, and then realizing they didn't notify HMRC um, uh, in time and therefore can't claim anyway. So we're putting in some checks around that. Um, but a lot of it will be just making sure that the advice we give you and the advice we give you from within the app lines up with the new legislation. Um, but we'll do more sessions on that for our users closer to the time and kind of walk you through all the changes so that everyone's aware of what they need to do. Right. Um, I am very aware. Thank you, Martin, for your comment there. Very aware that we've we've gone over time slightly, but we've had some brilliant... Oh, we've got one more. I'll, I'll quickly fit this one in, Daniel. Um, hi, I've never looked into it, but is it possible to adjust the aesthetics of the Whisper Claims report to match our individual brand? Oh, <laughs> this feels like this was planted, but I promise it wasn't. But I literally reviewed yesterday some work that the dev team have done. Um, so we'll be pushing this out really, really soon. So this allows you to put your own logo and your own corporate colors, uh, play about with the order of the section. So if you'd rather have the cost come first before the technical narrative, you can do that. And that's what we're going to let you do. So you have logo, cost, um, colors, section order, um, add a footnotes with a disclaimer, which is something we've been asked for by a few people. Um, so you can put in your own disclaimer saying, you know, you assert your um, intellectual property rights that kind of thing however you whatever you want to put in um and i think that's it for now so yeah it is coming in the next week or so that ability that's great thanks guys thank you all for your questions thank you for everyone who's contributed today it's absolutely fantastic to um uh, be able to answer them live for you if anybody's got um anything that they want to ask us offline uh, please do get in touch uh, there's an email address just there that, that comes through directly to us um we will see you again soon for our next events um thank you rachel um yep have a great tuesday everybody and um catch you soon <laughs> thanks. Bye. thanks everyone Bye bye